try that again. We had to do that twice at the first service. <laughs> the Lord be with you. Also Very good. Thank you so much. Welcome to worship here at Kenwick First Presbyterian Church. My name is Bob Merriman. and I am a commissioned lay pastor here. I shared with the people at the first service that I am uncomfortable with the title that is in the bulletin of Reverend Robert Merriman. Um, but I also noticed that sometime between the 9 o'clock service and the 11 o'clock service, Mike Spradling is now Reverend Mike <laughs> Spradling. So welcome to the club, unexpectedly. Um, yeah. Also, I want to wish everybody a happy Valentine's Day, happy Super Bowl. Uh, somehow it just... I'm not all that terribly excited about it, but oh well, here we go. Uh, lots of announcements and uh, lots of things going on here at the church. And so I'm going to invite uh, Karen and Ayla to come forward, the dynamic duo, and share a little bit about some of the things that are happening here. Good morning. Um, I'm Karen Premis, and this morning I'm here on behalf of the Find Community Team to tell you about our upcoming mission auction. And we're going to hold it March 26th here at church in First Press Center at 5.30. That's a little over six weeks away. So I need to have you stop thinking about items that you might be able to donate. Baskets of all types are awesome. Gift certificates services, um, arts and crafts, a rental house, all sorts of things we would love to uh, be able to auction off that evening. There are donation forms on our new mission uh, bulletin board right out here to the left of the church that you can pick up and fill out and then bring those back right away. The items themselves can't come to church until the week of the auction. We have no place to store them. so. And the money we raise from the auction goes to our mission projects, um, African Children's Choir, the Water Projects in Guatemala, Trail Seekers, Orcas Island, and um, in, uh, building homes for orphans in Jamaica. So any questions or anybody who would like to help, please let the team know. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Ayla with Fine Community as well. It's lovely to see the second service. I'm usually at the first service. You may have noticed all of the Valentine's decorations out when you were coming in. Fine Community would love to invite you to stop by after the service. There are blank note cards along with some lists of congregants that may not be coming into the service for one reason or another, but we'd still love them to feel God's warmth and God's love and to know that we are all connected as a church so we'd encourage you to, you can write a personal one to someone that is on that list. You can write a generic one and we'll get that sent out. But please stop by and send a little message to somebody that might need to hear it. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Um, I have several things that I want to announce because one of them is from Jeannie Colvin and if I don't do it I'm in big trouble <laughs> but she wanted to remind all of you that on February 15th 
which is the third Tuesday of the month, um, the best years group is going to meet. So if you are retired or if you would like to be retired, we ask that you please attend. Uh, it's going to be at First Press Center at 12 o'clock uh, so that arrive earlier, um, you get something to eat, uh, bring your own lunch, beverage and dessert will be furnished, and the special program will be a presentation by uh, Vic and Julie Epperly of their trip down uh, the Ohio River that they took, I believe, in the summer of 2021. So you don't want to miss out on that. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is, and, and I can tell from looking at you that you're all going to want to be participants in this, is the family uh, Nerf night, uh, February 26th from 4 to 6 p.m. You guys look like the people that like to shoot Nerf guns, and so I, I want you to put that on your calendars right now. Put it in your phones, write it in your to-do list. February 26th from 4 to 6 p.m. The other thing is today is Scout Sunday, and so we are blessed and honored to have serving us here today at worship uh, members of our Scout Troop. We have a Boy Scout Troop and also a Girl Scout Troop at this church. And so I'd ask that they please stand uh, and give them a warm round of applause. Uh, <laughs> Scouting is a great thing, it, it really is, and so we're, we're, uh, we're lucky to have a scout troop here. Also, are there any people here that were involved in scouting, Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts? If so, please stand as you're able. Are there any Eagle Scouts? Two of them, Reverend Mike Spread <laughs> and Jim Davis. Awesome. That's great. Again, welcome and thank you for serving here today. Um, one last thing. Oh, I took an informal poll at the first service as to, this is addressed to the men, how many of you have taken care of the Valentine's Day thing prior to... Oh. Okay. The results are similar to the first service. About 30% of you have and 70% of you haven't. Again, I will be seeing you tomorrow at Fred Meyer, picking up the flowers, hopefully getting a card, and uh, not embarrassing ourselves with our spouses. So anyway, uh, let's continue in our worship by standing and singing a hymn of praise.
comes from uh, writings from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in September of 1953, uh, presentation and prayer offered at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Most gracious and all-wise God, before whose face the generations rise and fall, thou in whom we live and move and have our being. We thank thee for all thy good and gracious gifts, for life and for health, for food and raiment, for the beauties of nature and human nature. We come before thee painfully aware of our inadequacies and shortcomings. We realize that we stand surrounded with the mountains of love and we deliberately dwell in the valley of hate. We stand amid the forces of truth and deliberately lie. We are forever offered the high road, and yet we choose to travel the low road. For these sins, O oh God, forgive. Break the spell of that which binds our minds. Purify our hearts that we may see thee. O oh God, in these turbulent days, when fear and doubt are mounting high, give us broad visions, penetrating eyes, and the power of endurance. Help us to work with renewed vigor for a warless world, for a better distribution of wealth, and for a brotherhood that transcends race or color. In the name and spirit of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And now rise as you are able and join us in the singing of hymn 579, Jesus Loves Me.
That was absolutely beautiful. Thank you for that. Today's sermon is entitled Levi, and that's, it's about the calling of Levi or the calling of Matthew, and it's, I think it's interesting that in Mark and in the Luke uh, versions of the call, he's referred to as Levi, but in Matthew, Matthew himself refers to himself as Matthew, and what's ironic about that is that Matthew, roughly translated, means the gift of God. Not that he was a gift to God, but he received a gift from God. And I think that's reflected, hopefully, in uh, the text of this sermon that you're about to hear. The scripture that I want to focus in on is in Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. And again, this is Matthew writing about his own call. And this is the version that you will find in in Dale Bruner's commentary on this particular gospel. So it may be a little bit different from your NIV or your NIV revised or any of those. But this is what says in scripture. And as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man sitting at the tax collector table. Matthew was the man's name. And Jesus said to him, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. And when Jesus was having dinner that night in the house, there were many tax collectors and questionable people who had come and were sitting there with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with with tax collectors and bad people? When Jesus heard what they were saying, he replied, healthy people don't have any need for a doctor but sick people do. Go back and read your Bible again, where it says, and then he quotes from Hosea 6, 6. Mercy is what I want and not sacrifice. Because I did not come to invite good people, I came for the bad people. If you take that same Hosea scripture and you look at Eugene Peterson's, the message version of it, this is what he says. I'm after love that lasts not more religion. I want you to know God, not go to more prayer meetings. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to begin, I already have heard, but I think it's worth repeating even if you have. A pilgrim was standing outside heaven, longing to enter in, watching as others were welcomed through the gates of pearl and onto the streets of gold. As he stood there, he saw a group clothed in white robes and waving banners approaching the gates. And he turned to the gatekeeper and he asked, who are they? And the gatekeeper answered, those are the prophets who prepared the way for Christ, who told of his coming and of the great joy that would be experienced at his birth. The man said, well, I'm not a prophet, so I cannot enter with them. Soon he saw another procession coming. It was a smaller group but a glorious one nevertheless. And they too were clothed in white robes. And again he asked the gatekeeper, who were they? Why, they're the apostles who walked with Jesus, Peter and James and John and Andrew and Bartholomew and all of the others. They're the ones who preached the gospel and established the church. And the man said, well, I'm not an apostle, so I cannot enter with them either. But as he continued to watch, there came yet another procession, much larger than the first. They too were clothed in white and carrying banners of victory. And once again he asked, who are they? Why, said the gatekeeper, those are the missionaries and the ministers who went into all the world with the gospel, inviting the lost and dying to come to Jesus. The man bowed his head and said, I'm not one of them either. But then... He heard the sound of many, many footsteps in the distance. And when he looked up, he saw a vast throng of people, more than any could possibly number. And what a motley mixture they appeared to be. He didn't exactly, he didn't understand exactly how he knew, but these were obviously the rejects of the earth, the refuse of mankind, 
publicans, or tax collectors, and sinners and harlots. And he thought to himself, surely the gates of heaven will not open for them. But to, to his amazement, the gates swung wide open, and he heard the heavenly choir singing songs of joyous welcome. Dumbfounded, he asked, who are they? And the gatekeeper responded, these are those who have sinned greatly, but who have been forgiven and saved through the grace of Almighty God. And the man leaped for joy and said, I'm one of them. I can enter with them. And he too walked through the gates of pearl and received the welcome of the heavenly choir. In Matthew's gospel, which we're focusing in here today, in Matthew's gospel, there is this pervading question. Who's in and who's out? Who's capable of being saved and who's not capable of being saved? And suffice it to say, Jesus' answers to those questions over and over and over again are unexpected. They're unexpected in particular by the religious elite or the Pharisees, and yet so full of love and grace for the rest of us. This unpredictability and this tension that is present in Matthew's gospel are present from the very, very beginning. Consider this. Why are the Gentile stargazers, the wise men, who know less about Israel's God than they know about Pisces and Leo, invited first to see the newborn king? Why does Jesus use the metaphor of casting a net that catches all manner of fish to suggest that his evangelism wasn't just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles. And that only the clean fish, those were the ones that would respond in faith to him, and those others would be discarded. They would be considered to be unclean. Matthew is the only gospel to share the the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, in which even the ones who come at the very last hour of the workday are paid the same amount as the workers who had been present all day long. Why is it that Jesus expands the scope of his ministry after his encounter with the Canaanite woman? Expands his ministry from the Jews to the Gentiles the same people that he refers to as being the dog who eats the scraps that fall from the master's table. In Matthew's gospel, nobody is beyond the purview of God's saving grace, not even tax collectors. And this, in and of itself, it infuriates the Pharisees. In the calling of Matthew, it's important for us to realize just how radical Jesus' choice was. Dale Bruner, in his Matthew commentary, refers to tax collectors as Palestine's quislings. I had to look that up. A quisling is a traitor who collaborates with an occupying power. And so what he's referring to is someone who entered into the service of the Roman Empire and amassed vast fortunes at the expense of their country's misfortune. And in doing so, they employ deceit and intimidation and even extortion to pad their own pockets. These tax collectors, these publicans that are referred to in Scripture, were excluded from being able to enter into the sanctuary, even though they were Jewish. Tax collectors were not permitted to testify in court cases because they were considered to be so disingenuous. Tax collectors were universally despised, if not hated by everyone, including probably some of Jesus' disciples. Can you imagine that conversation that the disciples may have had with Jesus when they find out that this guy, Matthew, the tax collector, is now going to be one of them? You did what? You asked him to be a part of your followers? What were you thinking? 
Even Jesus in Matthew 18, there's a section where he's talking to his followers about what do you do if somebody sins against you? And there's this very lit, this litany of things, steps that you're supposed to take. And then if at the end of that list, they still won't listen. Jesus says, treat them like the pagans or the tax collectors. In other words, shun them. So maybe you can understand how incredulous the Pharisees must have been when they see Jesus interacting with this guy named Matthew. And then when they see Jesus going to this banquet that's put on by Matthew, at which there's even a larger gathering of these bad people. And it really wasn't so much that they were upset about the fact that Jesus was hanging out with sinners because even the Pharisees believed in the forgiveness of sins. But the conflict pits Jesus against those who consider themselves to be the protectors of holiness and purity. And these bad people, these tax collectors, these harlots, these crooks and robbers, they were considered to be unclean. And in a sense, they were contagious. Think chickenpox or think even COVID. And the holiness code practiced by the Pharisees, it was a form of spiritual quarantine because these people who were unclean, they were contagious. So when Jesus invokes Hosea 6.6 6 about sacrifice, what he means, according to a Christian psychologist by the name of Richard Beck, is what he calls the purity impulse of the Pharisees. In other words, when we seek purity, we can only admit the clean, and we have to expel the unclean. Otherwise, what happens is the pure becomes contaminated. And once you become contaminated, you have to be discarded. You have to be uh, moved away from the group. If you want a more recent example, historical example, think about Jim Crow and the Jim Crow laws. And the laws of segregation where persons of color had to drink from different water fountains because white people feared that they would be contaminated. But when Jesus talks about mercy in that reference to Hosea 6.6, 6, he's talking about crossing the purity boundaries, breaking the quarantine. And the interesting thing about Jesus is that the unclean become the clean. So Jesus in our story, he crossed over the boundaries that kept Matthew apart from the rest of society. And Jesus did speak to him. And he said, come and follow me. And Matthew responds almost immediately. And he gets up and he leaves behind his former life. And by all accounts, he became a committed follower of Christ. History suggests that he preached in the Jerusalem, Jerusalem area for 15 years. And then he went into the mission field and established churches throughout that area. And he died a martyr's death. But the gospel accounts in Matthew and Mark, Mark and Luke, they don't give us a great deal of detail about what happens after this call. They spend more time talking about the elites reacting to Jesus and Jesus' choice of the company that he kept. But I want you to imagine for a moment what it must have been like for Matthew. What it must have been like for Matthew to be called from a place of sin and rejection into a place of forgiveness and reconciliation. Seemingly, Matthew's decision to follow Jesus was so very, very sudden, not clearly thought out. It was this tremendous, tremendous leap of faith. But the late Frederick Buechner says this about faith, and I love this quote. Faith is a word that describes the direction our feet start moving when we find out that we are loved. And faith is stepping out into the unknown with nothing to guide us, 
but a hand just beyond our grasp. I love that imagery. Dr. Bruner describes the call of Matthew, calls Matthew the collaborator as a perpetual walking witness to the depth of Jesus' forgiveness of sins. And John Calvin wrote that the theological meaning of the Jesus call of the tax collector depends not on the merits of our own righteousness, but on the sheer generosity of God. And I choose to believe that that call that Matthew received on that day long ago was absolutely, totally overwhelming to him. My wife, Mary Lynn, along with Linda Rice, attended uh, a number of years ago a Presbyterian mission conference in Atlanta, Georgia. And at that conference, a pastor spoke, and he indicated that one of the fastest areas of growth in Christianity at that time was among the untouchables in India. The stratification of the caste system in India places those people at the very bottom of society. They are the dregs of society. They are the dogs that are eating the scraps that fall from the table at the master's table. They are the ones doing the dirtiest and the most degrading jobs that you can imagine in Indian society. But the gospel crosses over those artificial constructs and says to those people, come and follow the one who eats with sinners and loves you unconditionally. Come and follow me. We have no idea. We have no idea how powerful that message is because we have never experienced that kind of isolation or degradation. As I indicated, all three of the synoptic gospels spend the most time describing the reaction of the Pharisees or the elites of Jewish society to Jesus' choice of company. And again, Dale Bruner refers to the Pharisees as the serious. They were the serious ones. The Pharisees were self-righteous in the sense that their adherence to the holiness code is what they believed gave them a seat at the table. And conversely, they determined whether others had a seat at the table based on whether they were clean or whether they were unclean. And their love had limits and it had boundaries and a whole litany of rules that made that love conditional. But Jesus' love transgresses those boundaries and it brings healing and empowerment to those who have been excluded from society. And it's also important for us to remember that it's Jesus that chose. Jesus chose. Jesus chose Matthew. He chose to extend an invitation to the disciples. The question of who gets in and who doesn't get in is not for us to determine. Jesus is the mediator for all of humankind. Christ chooses, not the other way around. And it's his gracious invitation and his alone that I believe, Matthew, it's his gracious invitation alone. And I believe that Matthew did not get up from his tax collector's seat and summon up the will to change his mind about Jesus. Rather, I believe that he came to Christ through the Holy Spirit that not only enabled him to respond in faith, but also gave him a change of heart. I believe that Matthew had a moment of faith. He had a moment of faith that caused him to begin to move his feet in a different direction once he found out that he was, in fact, loved. And that fact alone changed the trajectory of his life. Despite his past, despite all of his stuff. For me, it's important to remember that I have sinned. For me, it's important to remember that I have stuff, just like Matthew. And maybe some of you are in the same boat, I don't know. But it's important for me to remember that God does not grade on the curve. He never has and he never will. Matthew's sin is no worse or no better than mine because all of humanity has fallen short in some way 
from the glory of God. But fortunately for all of us, Christ is willing to dismantle and to remove those boundaries, to take down those barriers and meet us where we are and allow us to be transformed by the Holy Spirit, allows us to have a new identity, a new trajectory to our life, just like Matthew. The danger for us as followers of Christ is that we become modern-day Pharisees. I think I have, at times, bumped up against that in my life. I have found myself sometimes creating this prescriptive list of do's and don'ts and judging others and myself when we don't conform to that list. I've been guilty of occasionally using the Bible to substantiate my own convictions or to win an argument and not solely for the purpose of being transformed into the image of God. And I live in a world where almost all my Christian friends look like me and act like me. And I know, I, I can understand, I can articulate this thing about grace and the fact that I'm saved by grace, but I also hedge my bets by doing, by trying to do things and trying to be good and trying to be perfect. I don't do very well, but I try. Even those of, of us who have lived the so-called good life, who go to church and pay our taxes and say our prayers and seek always to do good, must question how someone who has lived a life that is the polar opposite of that, who has made really, really bad choices, how can they still have a seat at the table? And what about those of us who have made some really, really bad decisions, really bad choices, and feel like they are a million miles away from Christ? How could you not ask the question, could Jesus really be calling me? But there's that tension again that I talked about earlier. The tension again in Matthew's gospel that repeatedly invites us to consider who belongs does that person belong? Do I belong? And Jesus' answer to those questions is yes. Yes, you belong because I chose you. I chose you by the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, you belong. We belong. I belong. And it's because of that indiscriminate, reckless, and unconventional love of God that we belong. Jesus turned the world of the Pharisees upside down. Decades, if not centuries, of tradition had created this sophistry that our relationship with God was dependent on something that we did, some external standard. And Jesus is saying that our seat at the table has always been based upon his initiative and his irresistible grace that leads to faith and a change of heart. It's not something we do. It's something that Christ does. One of the things that I remember, I remember certain things. I don't have very good memory about other things, but I remember something that James Torrance said in one of his books. And what he said was, the indicators of God's grace always precede the imperatives of the law. God's grace always, always takes the initiative. So Matthew was transformed not by anything that he did, but it's that same love that God through Christ graciously extends to us through the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus saw something in Matthew that others could not see. And thank God that he did. Because who we are, good, bad, or truly, truly despicable, is never beyond the ability of God to love and to forgive.
<clears throat> I found two quotes that I want to share with you in closing. <clears throat> the first one is from a Scottish theologian from the 18th century by the name of John Haddington. And this one really resonates with me, particularly the last portion of it. I have been comforted for more than 20 years <clears throat> by the thought that Jesus welcomes not only the sensible sinners, but stupid ones as well. And the second one is from Frederick Buechner's Reflection on the Eucharist. <clears throat> the next time that you walk down the street, take a good look at every face that you pass. <clears throat> and in your mind say, Christ died for thee. Christ died for thee. Christ died for thee. Christ died for thee, Christ died for that girl, Christ died for that slob, that phony, that crook, that saint, that damned fool. Christ died for thee. <clears throat> I extended this invitation at the first service, but I want to extend it here again. If there's anyone here today who feels unworthy or unloved or alone, or isolated, or hopeless. I want you to find me after the service and we can pray together. Or even call me. If you feel the Spirit moving here today, and I hope you do, because I believe that it is, it's because you're experiencing what it feels like when you know that you are loved. That is something that I want everyone in this room to know and to experience today. You are loved. And nothing in this world can ever separate you from that love. And that love can change the trajectory of anyone's life, and it can also change the trajectory of this world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Would you pray with me? Dear God, create in us this day a love for one another, for all of your children who may feel unloved, isolated, hopeless, or even strayed away from you. As member of Christ's body, give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to be willing to move beyond the limits and boundaries of our own lives and to care for one another. We pray that in all things, in all of our interactions and experiences, we would treat the people that you put in front of us with respect and dignity. We pray for peace. We pray for peace that war can be averted in Ukraine, and we pray for peace and unity within your own church throughout the world. We pray for this community and for the safety of this community in the wake of the shootings at Fred Meyer. We pray for the safety of our schools, our children, our teachers, our law enforcement, our emergency personnel, Protect us. Protect us from ourselves. And we continue to pray and to lift up the people that we know are going through difficult circumstances. No matter the situation, we ask that your presence would be made known. We continue to pray for the sick. We continue to pray for Megan Garza as she embarks on what we hope to be the last round of treatment. We pray for the Garlic family and the loss of Carol. We pray for the family and friends of Rihanna Campbell, who was tragically killed in a rollover accident. We especially lift up um, Dave Burrell and Julie Burrell's granddaughter, Addie, who was a close friend who's struggling emotionally with this tragic loss. We pray that you would be at work in that situation. Lord, we thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to our prayers. The things that we have said and the things that are unsaid, we lift up to you. We want to conclude our time here now by saying and praying the prayer that you taught your disciples to say, by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, as we give our and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I'm Mike Spradling. I'm one of the elders with the church. Uh, for the last year, I've been a member of the Find Community team and would uh, encourage again all of you to please come join us uh, in about six weeks' time for the, the mission auction and at the end of the month of February for uh, uh, one of the greatest uh, nerf battles uh, this church has ever seen. In addition to uh, serving with the, uh, the Fine Community uh, team from this past year, uh, I am now in transition uh, to the, uh, the Steward Our Resources team, uh, particularly in the area of finance and stewardship, as I serve as the relief uh, for Dale, Car Dale Clark as he prepares for his surgery uh, a little bit later on. You know, as, I, as I think back to uh, uh, the sermon a moment ago, and as I think forward to, uh, to Valentine's Day and uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, love and happiness certainly is a big part of the emotions that come out with that, that holiday. Um, I would encourage all of us to be aware and, and thoughtful for emotions that look like empathy, misery, depression, anger, hurt, and guilt, because a lot of those types of emotions can come out in uh, the same time that we, we think about love and the folks that are around us. And so I would encourage us to pay attention for those feelings and those we meet uh, so that we can help guide compassionately. Um, more appropriate to my role with uh, Steward and Resources, uh, ask that we uh, prayer the, the prayer of dedication for this morning for the offerings that have been received. So Lord Jesus, you challenge your followers to give to God with commitment and thanksgiving. Receive our gifts as an expression of our commitment to you and your ministry. Bless them and us and use these gifts to offer hope and healing in the world you love. Amen. Please join us as you're able to sing uh, hymn 67, The Love of God.
Thank you for being here today. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Super Bowl Day. Now receive the charge and the benediction. May you know and experience and respond to the indiscriminate, extravagant, and unconditional love of Jesus Christ, now and forevermore. Go in peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a great day.